Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Nottingham Contemporary. I'm Miss Merwine, a curator of public programmes here. Um, I'm just going to make some brief introductions to our guests. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted to welcome back John Newling. Um, John is Emeritus Professor of Installation Sculpture at Nottingham Trent University. Um, he was born in Birmingham and studied at North Staffordshire Polytechnic, Chelsea College of Art and Design and Wolverhampton University before being awarded the first Fulbright Fellowship in Visual Art in 1985. He has installed works across Europe and, and the USA, as well as realising large-scale commissioned artworks in the public realm. Um, in conjunction with his retrospective exhibition upstairs, um, John has um, helped to propose the participants in this evening's discussion. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome the um, Reverend Dr. Richard Davey who is the Angl Anglican chaplain and a visiting fellow in visual arts at Nottingham Trent University. His research focuses on the way in which faith as a distinctive and countercultural worldview is embodied and materialised within works of art. He is also concerned with the process and function of writing on art, and in particular the way in which a practice of poetics can provide a valid research tool. He is also author of the book, um, which has been published on the occasion of this exhibition, which is entitled Nature, Culture and the Spiritual and the Work of John Newling. Um, it's available in our shop upstairs, um, and we've received the support of uh, Nottingham Trent University in its publication. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome James Pito, who is Head Curator of Temporary Exhibitions at the Wellcome Collection in London. He has held previous curatorial positions at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, and at the Design Museum, Science Museum and Whitechapel Art Gallery in London, as well as the Castle Museum here in Nottingham. He has a consistent interest in the capacity for art and artists to affect everyday life and engage with the world beyond the art world. Um, we're going to engage in a series of, of questions between us um, to start things off, and we'll probably be speaking for no more than an hour, and then we'll have half an hour at the end to take any questions from the audience, um, and then I expect we will retire to the bar, and so if you want to follow up any informal conversations, you can find us there. Um, I'm just going to ask a question to start things off and perhaps set this discussion in context. Um, I want to ask both Rich and James in, in turn um, how you first came to know John's work. I came to know John's work um, through his exhibition, Currents in Belief which was on show, it had been at, it started at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, but it was on show at the Genogoli Art Gallery in Nottingham University. And the director of the Genogoli, Neil Walker, knew of my interest, knew this exhibition had religious artifacts and said, Richard, would you do a conversation with John? And we'd not met before the conversation and we kind of entered into this conversation and actually realized a sense of synergy and and kind of friendship from that, and it's been you know a very close friendship ever since. But it was that kind of um, I hadn't really known much about John's work before, <coughs> and sort of text me thought, wow, this is incredibly interesting, incredibly um, exciting work. And had you um, written about his work before before the publication here? I'd written about his work um, twice. Once for um, the Church Times, which is the major. Um, church in the newspaper where I, I used to write regularly. Um, I find myself having less time to do so now, but I, used to, I wrote about um, the uncertainty and for them. And then John asked me to write the preface for his book, An Essential Disorientation, which um, was published by Museum of Sacred Art in Poland, um, a diocese in Poland, and that was looking at the liminal and the nature of the liminal and what John's work said about the liminal and liminality. Excellent. And um, rather frighteningly discovered that I first met John in the late 1980s, which is rather a long time ago, um, when I was working uh, for a short period at the Carson Museum. And John was a <clears throat> very important part of the first exhibition that I, I ever worked on. So I have very happy memories of that. And also, he made a work for the front of the Castle Museum in the period that I was there, um, which you may remember, which was made of blocks of salt, 
which are actually, um, I think, designed as cattle salt licks that you could buy industrially. And he made a cube out of them uh, encased in, in steel that sat at very squatly, rather like the castle itself, outside the front of the, of, of the castle. And gradually, the rain kind of fell on the salt, and the salt began to, to melt away and corrode the, the steel casing and made these very beautiful patterns in the steel. That was kind of like a sort of minimalist Robert Morris or Richard Serra artwork with added chemistry and added natural corrosion. Um, and then um, I actually worked with, with John on a, on a public art project that was curated by an Irish curator called Declan McGonagall in Newcastle. Uh, and then much more recently in my current role at Welcome Collection, um, John did a project with us um, called What Do You Do to Make Yourself Feel Better, which I can say a little bit more about in, in, in a minute. Thank you. Um, I think I was going to hand over to you now, actually. Yeah. If that's okay to do. Yeah. So, um, um, one of the things that, that I think is very particular about your work is that it has um, a kind of generosity to it. And the work that you that you did um, with us at Welcome Collection, if I can just kind of describe it very briefly, because it gives a, a bit of context I think, about um, how I know and understand John John's work, and also leads into to really the, the first question that, that um, I want to ask. Um, so in in 2009, John did this project with us where he and three helpers stopped members of the public on Euston Road in London and uh, engage them in a very straightforward transaction, which was to, to ask them, what do you do to make yourself feel better? Which I think is a, is a very lovely question. It's very different to the kind of common question, how are you? Because it demands that you kind of stop and think and think, Ooh, what do I do to make myself feel better? And um, they collected 500 people's answers from that kind of very transient population on Euston Road that has three stations on it. Uh, and then John and his colleagues transcribed the answers, what people do to make themselves feel better, um, numbered them one to 500, uh, printed them in a newspaper, and then also subdivided their answers into lists of actions, places, and objects. So the actions that people do, the places that they do them to make themselves feel better, and the things that they, that they use or engage with. Um, so actions would be things like, oh, I, I like listening to Mozart, or I like listening to Sex Pistols, or I play football. Places were such as uh, in the bath, on the beach, in Morocco, in my bedroom. Objects, pint of beer was a common one. Um, rather depressingly, a golf club was a very common one. Um, but then he listed the most popular in each of those categories, numbered them one to 50. So what was the most popular action, the most popular kind of place, the most popular object? And then reconstructed those actions, objects, and places into new sentences and new situations. So number one, the most popular, for example, it was kind of amalgamated into a situation which was, I like to have a drink and go to the shops to buy a book. Number five, I think, was I like to dance with a football in the kitchen. Number 50 was I like to uh, I would like to make a piano in Spain. And that was actually the title that John eventually gave to the project. So this became a kind of audit, if you like, of popular medicine, what people do to make themselves feel better. And, and as I said at the beginning, that I think there's a kind of generosity of, of spirit to what you undertake. Because as well as asking something, you like to return things to the people that you work with. So you then, in the project you did with us, you then had 500 newspapers printed those with all the answers, and those newspapers were given back to members of the public in the same place that the, the answers were collected. You also made some soil out of any newspapers that were left over. Uh, and, and you also very particularly gave a public reading of the answers to all of those questions. Uh, similarly to the way you did in, in Preston, where yeah. you, you read out the mysteries that you'd collected from people mm. uh, in the marketplace. So that's a very particular kind of engagement with the public. Mm. And I just wanted to ask you really, um, why are those kinds of transactions so important to the way that you work? I think, I think 
certainly in the last 15 years, those, those kind of projects have evolved, really. And for me, they, they start with an intention. The intention with that project was to talk with a lot of people about what they did to make themselves feel better. And one of the intentions was to try and better understand what an ideal city might be based on what people do and what people need. <clears throat> But those kind of projects, they, they kind of evolve. So I had very little idea at the very beginning what the very end would be. Um, and I, I like to be able to take my thoughts through, in, and out of particular spaces and particular activities with particular publics. So it kind of spreads itself. It's like a sentence that gradually begins to make sense to me. Um, I think also I, I, I'm particularly interested in, you know, when we were giving out the final bit, giving out the 500 newspapers, uh, which I did on my own, um, and it was a bit of a nightmare because uh, you are competing with an awful lot of other people, and when, exactly. when people see a newspaper that says, what do you do to make yourself feel better, they think it's some kind of propaganda awful newspaper. So I, I was giving them out, and, and, and people would take one and, and a few people came back and said this is fantastic, it's really interesting and engaged in it. But I, I think there's also that I'm interested in, in how a, a place uh, and a, an action, a situation, an event can, can kind of uh, wobble the etiquettes of the everyday really so that I gave out most of those newspapers in Euston because you know in the morning at Euston <coughs> railway station there is millions of people coming out and and I know that those people coming out they they kind of thought who's this pest that's just giving us a newspaper but the very fact that a few of them came back the next day and stopped me and I had a chat about the newspaper and really enjoyed looking at the statistics that are in it and the evidence in there that people do need to walk they do like art galleries they don't just want to go shopping um, that they found really interesting so it, it so, so very briefly, those those public actions they they kind of wobble the tacit agreements of of the everyday or the tacit agreements of place. And talking about place, it's a word that you that you use a lot. And I suppose that conventionally, public art is often talked about as being made in public spaces. Mm. But you you're I think much more likely to think and talk about and engage with public places and you've written a lot about the word place and can you tell us why that word particularly interests you yeah I, I again it's to do with I mean the very very early work was to do with um, I was fascinated by that you went to a fruit shop to buy fruit or you went into a bank to get money and I was really really curious about what would happen if and I've done this, if you, if you went to a bank and you encountered somebody performing close hand tricks with, with money tricks, essentially, uh, that have been sort of custom made and were brand new kind of tricks with cash, and, and to what extent that would wobble those very parameters. I think art has the ability to momentarily at least, perhaps in certain works I've done permanently, uh, change the parameters of thinking of somebody who's entering that place. I think the other things that really curious, uh, again, very early on, um, about how, how a place can become a myth. So a myth being defined here as the gap between the, the place expressed and our expression of that place. So a good example would be uh, where we currently live in Nottingham. When we first arrived, there was a place called the Pink Shop, <clears throat> and I, uh, I uh, as you do, I mean, you start to explore the cartography of where you live, and it's all exciting, and we've been told you must go to the Pink Shop. And we were looking around and couldn't find the Pink Shop, and, and eventually asked somebody where the Pink Shop was, and they said, oh, it's down there, around the corner, and there it is. Uh, because the Pink Shop was not pink, it was actually dull grey and we were looking for the pink shop but in fact what had happened in the history of the pink shop was that at one moment it had been painted an outrageous colour of pink 
and the myths in the in the in the locality in the area was so strong that still to this day that shop which is not pink is is a dull gray uh, is referred to as the pink shop and and I'm really interested in how how that works really how that how those uh, mythical histories evolve and how in fact art in a public space can momentarily also create those myths. I remember sitting in a pub um, in Nottingham actually after <laughs> after the fracas of physics of place and, and um, sitting there and luckily they didn't recognize me otherwise they'd have beaten me up but I, I was listening to them talking about physics of place it, 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 as an absolutely mythical object. It was quite extraordinary and that was within maybe two or three months of, of the piece actually coming into the world as it were. Um, and, and I was fascinated by that. And the, the, I mean the places that you choose to work such as that was a piece that was made for a very prominent place in mm. the city and you mm. talked about how it was a bit of a pain in the neck working at Euston Station because of all the people coming yeah. and going doing kind of yeah, similar yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. But actually, you you choose those places very deliberately, mm. uh, I guess, because they they are about as public yeah. as they could be. And oh, similarly, you did an extraordinary piece in the Market Square here in Nottingham, mm. uh, Saturday night and Sunday morning, where you drenched the square with floodlight. Again, it's it's the kind of the most public. Mm. place arguably in, in the city. Mm. Preston Market also a, a, a very public place where you can come to people's mysteries. Mm. Um, and I guess in some ways that these are the, exactly the kinds of places that where public art is traditionally cited mm. but a very different kind of public art to the kind that, that you do. Mm. But um, what what can you say about what what attracts you to those particular places and where it's where the kind of similarities to what might attract the municipality for example to commission a, a sculpture or a, something for those places yeah. but what attracts yeah. you to them often it's flow i mean marketplaces are a kind of really they do interest me as as spaces it's they're, they're spaces where people many different people go through. So I'm really interested in, in the context of these places. So, you know, if I'm, when I, I worked at Heathrow Airport and did a piece uh, called The Duration of a Wish, it was in a, a, a really preposterously called uh, World Business Center, it was a brand new building, and I built them a, a replica of their building, but made it into a birthday cake and began to look at the context of what, what a World Business Center at Heathrow Airport really was and, and then began to associate myself much more with the conditions of the workers there etc etc so my choice of place is, is sometimes it's, it's, it's somebody will ask me to go to a city to make a work and I go down and I really have a great time just because I love walking so I walk around the city and come up with a few places that I, I find intriguing often it's spaces between spaces as it were and uh, go away and then about two or three months later maybe we'll write to the people that want me to make a work and say look this is where I'd like to start and then the work evolves from from that so it's very carefully chosen which because mm -hmm. I want to ask you another question about sort of relationships with the public um, I think for, for most artists with as significant a body of work <coughs> as you have behind them um, their, their contact with the public is often kind of largely mediated by uh, through the art world mm. um, and you uh, you know through private galleries mm. public museums art fairs art magazines etc mm. you've had many exhibitions and prominent commissions and a very important and influential role in art education mm -hmm. but at the same time it seems to me that you've always kept what seems quite a, a rather healthy distance from a lot of the, the machinations of the art world mm -hmm. um, but since you started making work in the 1970s um, the interest that that kind of art world and the interest in contemporary art has, has really exploded and grown mm -hmm. enormously yeah. and I'm curious what you think about those explosions and changes and, and about what effect that has on the relationship between artists and public. Yeah, I think I, I think there has been fantastically positive changes 
in particularly in this country. Uh, you know, I work in a lot of different countries, and mm. each country is very dis has a very distinct sense of contemporary art practice. This country, I think, you know, in, when I was a student and then starting out, was was a bit odd, really, and and I got the sense of a country that barely tolerated contemporary art yeah, at all, yeah. uh, and and people were were actually quite anxiously against it, really, and just thought it was a load of nonsense and a waste of money, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the revolution that, that has happened, really, is, is that I think, I think, A, there's been a whole bunch of artists from this country and from other countries just making great work. Uh, and some of that great work has touched other publics, so I think that's been important. I think uh, Tate Modern uh, evolving as it did, um, and other galleries that pushed and advertised and and, and actually curated extraordinarily well, um, has has made a difference. Something like the Turner Prize or the Ralph Kent Award thing that I did um, has made a difference. So I, I, my my keeping away a little bit was to is was really a kind of dual thing. I I when I went to America, I did things like build a tent out of paper and 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 uh, made out of paper consumer paper bags. And one of the things I did in Los Angeles was to start a work where I pick, uh, asked permission to pitch my tent on the on the front front gardens of, of people that lived on on this road that leads to Beverly Hills, basically. And I was really interested, A, in the sculpture that I'd made, which was eventually went into a museum collection, but really was interested in, in chatting with these people and getting permission. I was a, they gave me permission because I was a Fulbright fellow, and over there there's this kind of currency associated with that. I, I didn't know that. Uh, but I was really interested in them. And then, then the same thing happened, though, in Los Angeles, where there were dealers there that wanted to own drawings and stuff. So. I, I managed to sort of play with the two, but but always because of where I come from, really, I think was intrigued by, you know, the tacit agreement of a white box art gallery museum. Really, logically, reasonably, is that it should show art about art, yeah. and and I think that still happens quite a lot, and I think that. That I didn't want to make art about art. I wanted to make art about life. Yes. Have I got time for one more question? Um, talking about making, uh, talking about life and, and art about life and living your art. Um, I, mean, I know that for the, the past few days you've been slightly laid up in bed <laughs> with a bad back, and I suspect that a lot of that is to do with with mm. sheer hard work. Yeah. Uh, and. In, in your exhibition upstairs, it's so calm and green and elegant that, that I think that the journey that those works have been on and the toil that they've involved isn't always discernible. Uh, sometimes it's deliberately discernible, but often it isn't. Um, but those works upstairs represent uh, days and days of heavy gardening, uh, the days of running out into the garden to chase squirrels away from gnawing at the bottom of the walking stick cabbages, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, hours and hours of solitary ironing upstairs in your studio. Um, uh, now, of course, a lot of artists work extremely hard, but in your art making, the, the work that you put in seems to me to have a very kind of different character mm -hmm. than the kind of work that goes into making something that is kind of above all a finished product. Mm -hmm. um, your, your work is sort of cyclical and it, it keeps mm -hmm. going. And um, I just wondered, uh, how do you define the character of, of, of that work and, and yeah. what sort of drives the, the, the commitment? Yeah. I, I think... Basically, what I what I do is I I because I'm old really I, I get up really early in the morning. Uh, in winter, dawn hasn't arrived. In spring, hooray, dawn begins to arrive, and I have a cup of coffee and a cigarette, um, and sit in the kitchen. And we're very fortunate. We live in a house that's quite high up, so there's a great view out the kitchen door of the garden and, and the landscape. And every morning. That's the moment where I'm sort of thinking about what I'm going to be doing and working on that day. And then I just work all day. 
Uh, but you know, things like the walking stick cabbages, the Jersey kale, really were uh, uh, were intense. They were intense because because it was a co-relationship with the, with the natural. So every day I'm looking at wind speeds and sun directions and trying to learn about uh, this little space, the little garden really at the back and, and, and trying my very hardest to ensure that the, the cabbages are getting the best they could possibly have and they're throwing stuff back at me like um, the moment I remember uh, in the summer when actually the whole neighborhood smelled of cabbage because this, this is a lot of cabbage and these leaves are huge and, and it, we, we had this swarm of uh, cabbage whites came down I just still can see it. These are things that really keep you going. Looking out the kitchen window and panicking when I just saw this white sort of hovering mass and it was just the cabbage whites coming down to lay their eggs into the walking sticks and kill them. And of course you go out there and you flap around, you know, there's nothing you can do and eventually you begin to 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 closely observe stuff. A lot of my the last 10 years really has been about looking at a non-journalist view of making art and looking at close observation, a very traditional way, but literally working as I did with the lemon tree, working with uh, close observation of that every day for uh, I think it's two years uh, and just writing every day about what was happening, this lemon tree trying to grow in soil that I constructed from one of my newspapers. Um, I, I really like labor uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so I found the last 18 months which has been very labor intensive, uh, an absolute joy. It's made me really happy actually so I really like working and, and the tables upstairs of course are, are in a way a testament to a kind of old labor. They're, they're they're traditional um, uh, tables that where you cut wood on or you, you make yeah, something. Really it's really talking a little bit about <coughs> labor and, and politics mm -hmm. and, and where we are now. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I do work really hard, but I love it. And I don't really it all seems to be seamless at the moment. The the you know, I it's hard to differentiate at any point when I'm not working. Yeah. And I think that's really come from a very long way back from really being a student, undergraduate student, and just building, training my brain to look at things. Uh, and my brain is a bit odd, in only in the sense that, uh, you know, I'm dyslexic and all the rest of it. And it kind of, and just training it so that every time I go on a walk, I look for things and I connect things with other things. And gradually this cartography builds and builds and builds until it becomes part of it. And that's a really nice feeling. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, I can introduce Richard into the conversation. Perhaps there's a link from this engagement with nature. Well, yes. Yeah. I think what, what intrigues me is that what we've heard is the process which is so important to John, the process he goes through, the materials he uses. I think you have to see the people he engages with on the Euston Road or in Preston or a couple, a couple of Saturdays ago in the um, Broadmarsh Shopping Centre as materials, just as you would use charcoal or, or paint, that, that people and their ideas are part of materials. But what has always intrigued me about John is that whilst, whilst you're described as a a performance artist or a conceptual artist or an installation artist, you are at heart a sculptor. Mm -hmm. And what I love about the sharp stairs and I've always loved about your work is that the ideas always have an end product and that end product is inherently beautiful and uses light and uses mm -hmm. colour and uses materials in, in the end. And I think we sometimes forget that because you're processes are so intriguing and interesting and the journey you take to get to mm. the end is so fascinating for, some, mm. for many people mm. and it also resonates and I think you know that's where you do fit into the to the art world's ideas where so much is about process now mm. but people forget that, that mm. you are an old-fashioned artist you make things mm. in the end yeah. even if it's mm. a newspaper that newspaper is beautifully designed mm. and it isn't just you're giving out newspaper, it is there is a newspaper 
which people look at and go, oh, isn't that beautiful? And I just you know, wonder if you could talk a little bit about being a sculptor. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I, I'm very interested in language and, and sentence structure, and syntax, and and and. And, and and my wife will be laughing now because she's just brilliant at grammar and uh, you know all the rest of it. But in a way, I see the work I do as a kind of taking materials in and out of different transformations. Some of which uh, I will make, and other others of which I'm dependent on other connections. It, mainly recently, connections with the, with the natural world. So, you know, I'm. The, the relationship, that Anthropocene relationship of uh, humans affecting the climate are, are kind of all part and parcel of it. I, I work really hard and, and at trying to, trying to see where this elusive thing is leading to and also uh, having at the end of that elusive set of processes something which carries itself as having a, a slight autonomy to it, which is the object. And I think, I think what what is the most difficult part is the getting up at dawn in the morning and slamming your brain around for ages, thinking, you know, what is the final form of this going to be? What what is it? And, and you know, I can spend three or four months. Uh, uh, having got to a certain stage with the work before I decide what it's going to actually eventually be. Those moments are sublime, really, and, and they are, you know, they're, they're as good as, as the liminal hours, in a sense, because you, you know, you might go to sleep having thought, oh, this is it, I've had enough, you know, and, I, and you wake up in the morning and you say, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a glass of water with a spinning top in it or whatever and and it's a fantastic feeling because you then just do it and 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 you look at it you think yeah okay it's all right uh, and and then you start working on something else and it's that condensing down which i found fascinating that yeah the kind of it, it, it's like the bowls in weight yeah. which are upstairs those amazing yeah. bowls of dust of human detritus of mm. human debris mm. which lie on the bowl in, in the bottom of the bowls, which started with going in to try and get money changed, 2p, brand new 2p coins changed, and finding that actually they didn't weigh the amount they should have weighed. And, <coughs> and as ever with you asking the question, why not? And, and mm. the question leads to these amazingly beautiful mm. objects. And that intrigues me, but the process as well is, is so important. And, mm. and one of the things which struck me as, as we were talking about and putting the book together was this journey you've been through where you are still scrabbling around in dirt investigating. You started this back as a student at Stoke when you were on a canal foot, um, towpath investigating the dirt and you're investigating the dirt on a on 2p coin and you're now playing with dirt in the soil, <coughs> making dirt itself. Actually, you've gone from using dirt to making dirt so you can play with your own kind of soil homemade dirt, and homemade right. dirt and soil. And I find that fascinating, that this kind of journey of creation, of looking and uncertainty, of not knowing yeah. what, what you're going to find. And, it's those, and again, it's those borderlands that you seem to occupy. Your back garden, when you're looking out on the edge of Mm. on the edge of this kind of, not a sheer drop, but the edge of this mm. hill to look out over the north of Nottingham, mm. the borderland of the canal footpath, the borderland mm. um, of a road, of a path, a pavement in the Euston Road, which yeah. is itself a borderland at Euston, that kind of space between Euston and the mm. Welcome Chapel, you know, it's quite a borderland as people passing to and fro, um, fro as, they, as they go to work, but they're kind of just meeting and crossing there. Liminal spaces and borders seem such an integral part of what you're looking it's at. Certainly, yeah. I, I think I think the cartography that I described earlier that kind of does involve 
you know, where are the edges, and, and also involves an abiding interest, really, in 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 the sort of participant observer. Mm. And I think, you know, I, over the decades, really, I've gone from being I've hovered in my work between either being more a participant and less an observer. And this, the participant observer is a, an anthropological method used, invented in the 1920s, really, of a way of, because I'm really, in essence, interested in what it means to be human and, and what value might be, and, and then seeing how the work can disseminate itself like a seed in, in different kind of forms and ways and spaces. It's very simple, really. Um, but yes, I, 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 I'm interested in threshold. So I, I mean, I did a lot of work in the in the late 80s on, on doors. I know that sounds a bit banal, but it was, you know, I, I sealed up our house at one point and cast every every way out of the house and took out all the light and made that manifest. A lot a lot of work like that, which were essentially they were they were really shown in uh, Jollenbeck uh, Gallery in Cologne, who were dealers at the time. Uh, Michael Nickel, uh, Jollenbeck, brilliant dealers, uh, and and they could. They, they enjoyed the black steel works that I was building. But certainly, yeah, crossing a threshold, going through a threshold, uh, is one of the things that intrigued me actually early on about churches. I couldn't reconcile, couldn't understand why, you know, I could go into a bank and, and, and I wouldn't feel much different going into a bank than I did in, inside the bank or outside the bank. Uh, say perhaps with a fruit shop, unless I was really excited and desperate for a bit of fruit, uh, which in the early days was quite rare. Uh, <laughs> and then, the, but the same thing. The, but I, I needed to understand better what, why everybody I knew, and including myself, when we entered the church space, there was something weird happened in that threshold space. Uh, so that that actually was part and parcel of my interest in churches right? mm. as well. And I think what's happened since, with what's fascinating me, is, is this movement from the interest into the church as an alien space yes. into actually almost creating a church um, or church spaces in the newest work where they're, they're not churches, stuff, but they are sacred spaces. Um, We've talked mm. about it in the book as kind of like pilgrimage sites or mm. or as these roadside shrines that mm. in the Middle Ages where people would for a moment walk past and suddenly mm. they'd see a cross or they'd see something, um, a, a, a statue, and they'd stop and it would feel different and other. It's, it's like the prayer flags in, in Tibet and, and those kind of spaces where you go and as you're walking through the world suddenly as you said, there's this wobble mm. as things seem different. And churches do that for many people, but it's a physical object. And your work is, and these objects you create mm. form these physical wobbles, these wobbles in people's lives. So mm. why are you happy? A church is a place where people, in a sense, are supposed to think about what makes me happy, what, mm. what is the meaning of my life. And you're doing the same when you say to somebody on Euston Road, what makes you happy? What makes you feel better? Mm. And makes them stop mm. and actually think differently to to how they would normally. It makes them come out of themselves or, or cross a threshold into a different way of thinking or different way of. I think so. I mean, existing. we even had it a little bit. We had it a little bit on, uh, gosh, time uh, last Saturday mm. when we did uh, the Riddler jacket, where we were a place where it becomes a site value. Um, and I was really, there's something very interesting happens with a, a work like that. We were, we were exchanging uh, bits from this massive, long piece of sculpture that looked really quite elegant in Broadmoor Shopping Centre, a very difficult place, but a place I deliberately wanted to position this work. Uh, <clears throat> and we were exchanging them for, for little, little bits of that 
that 50 meter sculpture in exchange for people writing down what they valued in their lives. Of course, we're looking there at a different kind of capital. So we were in a place of capital, shopping center. I, I did work very early on in the first ever shopping center, the Beverly Center in Beverly Hills. And, and I, it did remind me, actually, of, of the works I was doing there in uh, 85. But, but what was important about the, the people we met was that they started to do something really significant. They started to touch. They wanted to, to touch the merino wool. And as soon as people start to want to do that, it, it actually is a really good sign. And then later in the day, in the morning, they started to want to have their photograph made in front of the sculpture. And this is all, this is really kind of interesting about how people look look at art to a degree. They wanted to have some ownership. Uh, and I thought, hold on, it's not going to be a disaster, this. I think it's going to work. I mean, there were one or two people that clearly were kind of like, I'm going to <laughs> kill John Ewing, where is he? Uh, but, but not not many. Uh, and and so there are all those kind of things that you 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 re begin to recognise. City Council did it brilliantly. There, are, Anish Kapoor's Sky Mirror, I think, is is a fine work. Uh, but the City Council did it with um, oh, the football manager Brian Clough. They, if you look at how people are are reacting to the Brian Clough sculpture as a work of public art and the way it's positioned, so it's given its own little space. It's very clever. It's actually quite knowing. Whether it's an accident or not, it doesn't matter. But they have understood that people actually want to go and sit with Brian Club and have their photograph with Brian Club. So there's a kind of interest there. I think what you do is, is different. I, absolutely, mm. I think you're absolutely right. Mm. The, that the Brian Club um, statue, but that's quite like the people who go to Madame Tussauds and and stand next to um, sure. uh, the waxwork sure. of, of their favourite celebrity or yeah. even their not favourite celebrity, or the people who see a celebrity in the street and can't nowadays with the mobile phones very quickly can't get it out, take a photograph of, of me and want to be um, mm. photographed with a famous person. Mm. What I loved about the Riddler jacket mm. was it, again, thinking back to the objects and those like the, the walking stick which mm. exemplified support mm. um, back for your for mm. the piece um, for the Museum of Modern Art in Ireland. Mm. The Riddler jacket, it wasn't the jacket as such which was the significant thing for me, it was those question marks on that cloth. Mm -hmm. It was mystery being put. You were asking a question without giving an answer. There was no answer there. You were you but you were doing something which actually in this world People are looking for it seems to me, but mm. but it's quite is also a difficult subject to talk about at times. Mm. What is mystery? We don't want mystery. We want to be able to say this is what life is like. Mm. This is what reality is. Mm. And what you do is say, hang on a minute, no, there's uncertainty. This world is all about uncertainty yeah, and about yeah. mystery, mm. not in a frightening way. Yeah, yeah. And it's not in a way we got to find the answers. But it's about let's celebrate mystery and uncertainty. And I love those question marks and. And in the book, that's the, yeah, mm. not the, the final, but the second mm. to last image is a piece of that cloth because it exemplifies what you are trying to do. Question marks saying there is mystery in this world. Mm. Live with it. I, th I think I like, I like unanswered questions. It's, uh, I like questions that can't be answered, non empiric questions. You know, because I think they're a kind of fuel that, that keeps, keeps us human, really, and keeps, keeps us kind of going forward. Um, I think th there are there are there are moments in all of the projects. There's the, I remember you know, a couple of people from the Western Market Mystery Project. One, the first was a really interesting one. The first was one of the people that paid for a bit of it from the city council. <laughs> it turns out he was he was the he was quite high up in the Preston City Council, and he came to the store and he w really desperately wanted a certificate against loss of mystery. And he came up to me and he said, John, I've really got a problem. He said, there is no mystery in my life at all. <laughs> there are, I don't have any mysteries. So 
you know, poor city council. I thought, blimey, there must really be something odd going on. So I said, come and have a pint. And we went and had a pint together. And by the end of the evening, he had hundreds or thousands of <laughs> mysteries in his life. And, and, and of course, then we became friends because he, he really genuinely thought that I'd identified something in him that was just, it really rattled him actually. And so that, that and then there was another woman who, who just had mysteries falling out of her head and she'd come every day and give us, you know, literally, we had, we, we wrote them down, but they didn't, it would have been a separate book. With, with these things, what, what begins to happen is that you get, I think with the Preston Market, it was about 250 that I read and then was amplified across the city uh, at night in the, in the marketplace. Uh, mysteries. <clears throat> but you get these um, people that really, really, really get intrigued with the whole project. and They stay with you as a group, usually through email. Some people haven't got email, so that there's, there's a bit of letter writing going on. Um, they're perhaps not interested in art at all, but but they're really particularly interested in 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 how this project might evolve or evolve, and, and how actually you know somewhere like because this was a proper project as they all are really. Lloyd's of London had underwritten, you know, that, that these people could have come back with their certificates. Uh, against loss of mystery and said that they'd lost their mystery and make a claim, make an insurance claim. Lloyds of London wouldn't play, wouldn't, wouldn't, were not willing to write uh, a, a legal phrase which would underwrite mystery. But that was part of the project as, as well. And it was done, that was done for London Festival. So that was the very beginning of that project, was, was trying to get Lloyds of London to insure me against loss of mystery. <laughs> and, and, and the conversations, of course, that took place were brilliant for, for me. I mean, it's fantastic. And, and they did engage it, and, and they never really sussed what was going did you, on. Did you record them, any of them? I have a, yeah, it's in my archive. <laughs> they knew it was safe bet that, you know, that you were never going to lose mystery, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, it's just interesting how we define these terms. I mean, the. You know, the bird does fly to catch the cage all the time. We do it in art. But I think my experience in art is that even in art, we, we, we do need to, we fly to the cage. We, we fly to tick the box all the time. And, and I think one of the glittering things about art, which is, you know, it, it's slippery, is that it, it actually has the ability not to do that. It's almost unique in that sense. I wonder if that might relate, James, to how you would see art functioning within the institution you work in now, which is principally involved in science, and science is something you see as being about explanation rather than mystery. Yeah, I, I, I suppose traditionally science is seen as trying to get rid of all the mysteries, mm -hmm. solve them all, put everything down in, in black and white, Where, but, um, but obviously you're very interested in the grey areas. That's where your real interest lies in, in the questions and the, and the unanswerables. So philosophy seems like a kind of natural area of interest yeah. for you, but, but actually science is a really strong area sure, yeah, of interest. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're, yeah. Two of the, the valued people in your eclipse works are Crick and Watson, who <coughs> discovered the structure of DNA. Yeah. Um, so can, can you say something about your, your interest in scientific disciplines, which I suppose are traditionally seen as trying to yeah. determine black from white and get rid of the grey? It, it fascinates me. I mean, I, I think somebody who's talked a lot about the, the well, particularly with institutions, how institutions, for example, all institutions in my experience, will start with good intentions. So even art institutions will start talking about art a lot all the time, but eventually the values of those institutions become the inherent values within the institution. What is valued is something else other than the subject that they originally were, in, were, were brought into the world to do. Um, my interest with scientists is 
It's that I think they're brilliant. And I think they, they have exactly the same roots of curiosity that all artists have, uh, all people have really, is that, that they do something, something happens, and they think, why did that happen, or how did that happen, or what part of my body did that? And in, in a way, my interest with science does start with the body, and a lot of my works have, have been the wine from Jet and Vine. So I mean, one of the things that I was interested in is art that goes through the body. My interest in the Eucharist wafer is, is, is about transubstantiation, but it's also really about the fact that something goes through the body. And I've made num lots and lots of works that, that really have come, in a sense, from a, from a live art perspective, uh, which I, I'm still really interested in and taught for many years. I was part of a team that taught for many years. Um, my interest was with science is, is that they just seem so damn kind of rigorous and, and, and sort of honest. And I think, I think what's great that I've noted, and I, I do look at new biologies now and, and look at plants and look at how soil works. And much of the science I've looked at was probably 19th century science, which is close observations, it's kind of stuff that I, I do myself in, instinctively uh, in order to understand the world better and understand the specifics of what I'm studying better. Um, and that still continues in the science. It, 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 it is still, it's still observation. Okay, the machines that have been invented, the technology that's been invented for that observation to be at a molecular or a sub-molecular level uh, exists and it's fantastic and it, it, it helps all of us. So, I, I think we're we're probably approaching a golden age in bio sciences in in our own health and well-being. The only thing that I, I frankly worries me is that I can't imagine living for a thousand years. Can you imagine adolescence that would go on for maybe fifty years, or an adolescence that went on for as long as I've lived on, on the world would be a dreadful thing. But I I have a uh, since. Now, when artists and scientists get together, and it used to be called Sci-Art, I know James, who is, is not involved in Sci-Art, but I, I had a real problem with that, because it tended to, to be that the artists appropriated the glittering image from the, art, from the scientists and showed it as, as a visual, and, and it kind of, I, that felt very disappointing. So if I work with a, in collaboration with a scientist, it's really about... Uh, both of us acknowledging each other's abilities uh, completely and also understanding that both of us will, will perhaps uh, not understand. You know, I can't expect the scientists to understand the history of contemporary art, which is, which is a very important thing for me, or me to understand the history of genetic science, which is kind of impossible. But what, what, what does get interesting is when the conversations really look at perhaps the implications of, of what a scientist or an artist are doing, then it becomes really relevant to the social domain. Yeah, but as well as the implications and your fascination with, with those, you also seem to really enjoy the processes or well, some of the processes. Yeah. So for example with yeah. the, the weight, I mean that was really quite a kind of rigorous yes. scientific process that that work went through and yeah. with the the hydroponics with Chatham vines yeah. and currently yeah. grown the Moringa trees. I mean, you're really, it's kind of almost like primary research that you're doing. You're yeah. really embedding yourself in kind of understanding how, how these things work yeah. from the inside. Yes. Um, but, but would you, how would you characterize or would you want to characterize any difference between scientific approaches to engaging with the natural world and, and with what art can bring to that engagement? I think I, I, I... I think I think that maybe one of the differences is kind of just being gobsmacked by it. Uh, so you know, I think it could be, and, and this this is lack of knowledge really. I'd like to think there is no difference, um, but I think one thing that might be different is 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 you put a, uh, those walking sticks upstairs. The seeds on them are dust, 
they're, they're extraordinary. And, you know, after 15 days, fingers crossed, and you've got the conditions ideal for them, um, you should begin to see something growing out of the soil. Uh, and I, it's miraculous for me. That is just incredible. Now, a scientist might not see it that way and might not say to themselves actually there's so much shit in the world but it's a completely brilliant place it's just amazing and that uh, you know all seven billion human beings that currently exist really 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 need to just understand that that it is an amazing place to be and that human beings uh, despite being seven million strong, are endangered by human beings. They need to understand that. I'm not sure scientists will always do that because they are preoccupied with the, with the internal, internal mechanisms of that growth. That said, uh, yeah, I'm preoccupied with that as well. So uh, I think, I, I really think there are similarities, yes. Do you think you're, you're trying to cultivate a kind of attitude of Wonder, I think wonder is the word. Mm. Whereas perhaps a scientist mm. views the plant more as an, mm. a tool towards a certain objective. Mm. You'd be encouraging people to work here to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Which it's kind of connects closer. against the idea of, mm. of not wanting to explain it at this kind of. I, I, mean, I don't know, I, I think there's something we need to. For me, what started to make sense about what John is doing is when he showed me at the beginning of our conversation last year, when we, were, you know, we were looking specifically at how we look at the whole of his work, um, it was a series of drawings which he, in a sense, rediscovered mm. the nine interests of nature. Mm. And he'd done, he'd done these at, at Wolverhampton. Mm. And what f they did for me was actually give a context for the whole of the work and this interest and what you're doing. And it, it, it's almost a medieval practice. It goes back to a medieval kind of way that the world is holistic. The way we see the world should be holistic. You, the, the, that the greatest scientists um, in the Middle Ages were also theologians and they were artists as well. Mm. And there wasn't a distinction. You didn't have a distinction that the fine, the fine arts, the liberal arts, included theology and they included science and sure. physics and so on. And, and I think you did that. And, and what I find have found intriguing is, is, is you naturally do that. And I've been watching the Brian Cox series on the mysteries of life that he's just started. And it's fascinating. I love, I love the kind of thing about the atomic structure because that's something which fascinates mm. me and, mm. and, and kind of relates to art. But then he loses mystery. There's no mystery in it for him. It's, it's just a process. It's, it's a mm. physical process. <laughs> And and I read somewhere that uh, kind of commenting on on, on that series, he, he explains how the world works, but he doesn't ask the question why we're here. And it seems to me that you ask why, as well as how. Mm. And and uh, yeah, you may may not want to, but but those kind of intellecting interlocking circles that started with a kind of a line with a nine twist of nature, and then kind of creating this spiral. It was constantly spinning into a double helix, almost you know the double helix of DNA going backwards and forwards, and then they became three interlocking circles, which were the um, organic, the um, cultural. cultural, and the etheric. Mm. And kind of as, and that's where the book, you know, kind of the, the, the subtitle is, you know, nature, culture, and and, and spiritual. Mm. That's what it is. Is that it is you see the world in this way as a whole place, not separate, you know, separate that into science or art, but actually, why yeah. do we separate them? I think, I think those, the, those drawings are kind of curious because they were, uh, they were done over a, a, a period of about a year, and, and I think there's close to 50, 60 of them, um, and they've never been shown before because I put the word research on them, and of course, you know, I think, well, that's research, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, the, the drawings were, were my attempts, really, to look at one algorithm, one thing that, that I was looking at, and trying to, trying to look at geometry and, and this set of rules, and just exploring them 
over and over and seeing what happens. And eventually what, what, what happened was that I made a speculation with the concentric circles and the axis that comes from them and the shapes that it generated, which were nine dominant twists. Uh, and then it repeats itself. Uh, we did some experiments where we, we transplanted the concentric circles to circles on a tree that had been cut and did the same drawing from it. And of course the drawing then just goes all over the place. And it, it configured loosely the original shape of the tree. Uh, and that was where my interest in sort of science began to come in. And I, I got quite a, a, a buzz out of that. At the same time, you know, teachers are really important. At Wolverhampton, I was a, a fellow there. And so was uh, kept alive, really, uh, with a bursary. <clears throat> but I, I had two mentors. One was Paris Chakravuti, uh, who was a painter there. But who, who happened to be a Brahmin monk, and that was really extraordinary. And externally, a man called uh, Keith Critchlow, who used to teach at the RCA and the Architects Association, uh, whose expertise is on uh, uh, Islamic geometry. So part of the kind of going down to London to talk with Keith was to attend his lectures on Islamic geometry. And, and so, you know, I got this, this double hit, really, of... of I knew about Platonic geometry, and suddenly I learned about the mathematics and Islamic geometry in a, in a, a fundamental way through Keith's, Keith's lectures. Uh, and so those works are are important, but in in the rush of things, tended to be forgotten. It was Alex that you know found them when he went through the studio and said, oh, "I think we'll have these." <laughs> uh, on. And I'm very happy that they're there. And I think what fascinates me is that in these works, mm. they they offer to me what is a contemporary spiritual art, mm. a, an art which is is not tied down into a specific um, religious point of view. You've done your church works, which seem which had a particular identity, but what do we get in the, in the, those early works, but also in the latest works, is something which is actually asking us to see the world as a, as a place of mystery, a place of transcendence, a place of imminence, mm. a place of otherness, and also not just of otherness, but about ourselves. And, and, and these two images, which mm. hadn't been completed until just before the show, yeah. I think capture 30, 35 years of work that you have mm. two beautiful objects you have the two pea coins, yeah. which are also Eucharist wafers, which are also wishes. Sure. You have nature, mm. you have time, mm. and you are very much about slow time. Mm. And you have the eclipses. The and, eclipses, yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and what I love is those waiting for those moments, or the kind of sudden shock when suddenly either in the green face a golden sphere occurs, mm. or in the golden face nature occurs. So as the transcendent becomes imminent, it reminds us that otherness has to be grounded in in the everyday, in this reality, but also in this reality there are moments of mystery. I, I just find those two amazing and yeah. you know, kind of they, they capture what your work has been and what your work is doing. And yeah, I, to I, me I, you know, when I made them, I, I nearly remade them. I you always do. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, I am, I am pleased with those works. Uh, it's also very important that when you're in that space, of course, you, you, there are clocks that are working, so you can actually predict when the next eclipse might come. But you have to eclipse. You, you have to. A uh, uh, few people haven't yet sort of experienced the fact that there is a clock working behind that surface. And these layers, I mean, the whole show has many, many layers in it. It's, it's a kind of archaeology uh, that, that, that just evolves right over the years. And I think probably the most recent ones, they're, they're kind of an evolution that you can trace back 30 years. And, and that's why I think we kept on talking about the notion spinning, of spinning. Yeah. Well, I, I, I used to love as a kid yeah. spinning. I, I mean, I, I, one of my favorite games uh, was just spinning falling over. I do remember that vividly, <laughs> and, and that was important. 
and I think that was just the thrill of being disorientated uh, and, and, and I kind of looked at that disorientation much more seriously as I've gotten older but I, 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 the earth spins so it's kind of obvious really yeah. and I collect spinning tops and, and I like the, the the shape that goes like that which you can see in one of the last pieces which was actually that element was built way way early 80s uh, but needed to go in the show and that was the place for it to go uh, that shape is very important to me. It's kind of extrospective, introspective. So it goes that way, but it also goes that way. So it's a bit like sunlight and plants. And I think it's Steiner writes about extrospective, introspective spaces, which I studied in the in the seventies. So the, the these things that I'm talking about are not all instinctive. A lot of it is instinctive, and it's kind of just walking the streets and learning and, and constant every day, just just really getting excited and learning occasionally bit by bit but there is also theologians, philosophers, uh, people like yourself in conversation, James is a curator that I admire and the brilliant through really, the Welcome Collection, people like Declan McGonigal who, uh, who was a, a kind of mentor in the 80s, Robert Hopper who brought me, uh, well I, I kind of found this space at Dean Clough and uh, and did a big show there, cleaned it up with my mate, uh, brought Robert Hopper in, he loved the work and loved the space, he then spent millions on it and that became the Dean Clark Henry Moore uh, space for uh, what was called the Masters Program and that was where I was introduced and was part of uh, Giuseppe Pannoni, uh, Magdalena Jetilova, uh, James Terrell, Boltanski, that group of people. So. You know, whilst we're talking about um, these these experiments on the street and, and all the rest of it, which which is part and parcel of what I do, I've also been really privileged to work with some great curators over the over the years. Good people, uh, including people here. I have to say, it's been a, a remarkable, and this isn't an advert. It's been a <laughs> remarkable experience working with Nottingham Contemporary just learning really re-entering this white box space that I've been out of for a while, in and out of, in different countries, different places all the time. So that's really important. The other thing that was important through those mentors, Declan is brilliant on civic space and, and uh, he is in my view one of the most important curators and Robert Harper also was the same. Robert had the cash to do anything he wanted to at one point. So, you know, he could get Pannoni to come over and do a bit of casting and start commissioning. <clears throat> the other thing that I think, uh, no, I've lost my thread now. Yeah, it's okay. Well, come back to, in the sense of, you know, a bit before what, mm. to that form, which is so important to you. Mm. What I find fascinating is that sometimes you, you do hit these truths which others have hit, and you don't know anything about it. Oh, so yeah. one yeah. of the things, one of the um, lines yeah. of poetry which you came out with constantly, and yeah. you often come out with, is, is yeah. from W.B. Yeats, yeah. um, spinning and spinning um, in the, the turning, turning and turning, turning in the widening jar. jar. The falcon cannot hear the falcon. Yeah. And then you start doing some research. I started doing some research. Looked up W.B. Um, Yeats. Mm look at what a jar is, and the jar is exactly that form mm. that you described, and it's exactly, mm. and he understands it in the same way that you understand it, and you had no idea, and I just find that fascinating, that actually yeah. in this working, in this close observation that you share with others who closely observe the world, somehow you are like the archaeologist in Leicester car parks finding <laughs> truths oh, yeah. which have been buried long ago, and yeah. And suddenly you're getting, you're not just kind of wildly going, but you're going, you're finding a, an R in the ground. Yeah, and yeah. There he is. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to go any further. Yeah. And, and somehow you, you're excavating and finding a truth without having to wildly go all over the place. Somehow you're finding truths in your practice which yeah. say something fundamental about the nature of reality. Well, I think, it, I, I forget which philosopher it was, but who said, because. Uh, uh, you know, again, when I was a student, uh, 
undergraduate student. Everybody hated complementary studies for our history. Everybody, except me. I absolutely <laughs> adored it. And they were very good with me as a student undergraduate. They just gave me a room with a key, a big, big, big room, and just said, make something, and we'll come and see you every few months and chat to you. And I just kept building. Complementary studies were very important to me um, because I was introduced to philosophies and theologies and films and you know the relationship, the, the kind of canon of 20th century art and, and gradually that was important to me and gradually in sort of early 90s I began to see that I actually was part, could, could be placed in the, with the situation this sort of conceptual artists and I actually had you know, I was not this, this, this person that was miles from nowhere and working in Nottingham at that time, probably. Yeah, I was working in Nottingham. Um, that, and, and working very hard and thinking, well, you know, I'm, you're not part of anything. But of course I was. And, and, and that was really important. And that's one of the things I'd really like to see in fine art. I know it's not a popular thing, but... I'd, I've talked to so many thousands of students who, who you know, I do have great respect for. Wow. Amazing. Uh, but when you sometimes recently, when you ask them things like, you know, uh, an artist that's worked in the 50s, 60s, or, or even the 90s, who's w worked in a very similar vein to what what they're doing, and they haven't they haven't got a clue. I, I think that's wrong in some ways. I just think they would feel so much happier to feel that they are engaging in an ongoing They're process. They're interested to go and look at, at what yeah. you, they are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just part of belonging, you yeah. know, and it makes art stronger yeah. if you can feel that you belong to it. All art's belonging. They're kind of the great yeah. you know, artists of, of, of any century. Mm. They react to what's gone before, mm. and that's why they uh, Unique and, oh, yeah. and new, mm. not because they're doing something without because, thinking about what's gone yeah. before, but because they are reacting to what's gone before and what they are trying to deal with. They're not separated out from; they are <coughs> integrated into the history of you know their process. Yeah. I feel like it might be. I, I have I have a question I could ask, but I feel like we've been talking between ourselves for a while, and so I wanted to. Pause, perhaps, and see if there are any questions from the floor, from the audience. I have a question. In your country, you work. Sorry. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the interesting conversation. Um, I have a question for John Newling. Um, in the country that you work for, like, I've done artwork and research. Have you noticed any differences, I'm guessing, between the relationship between humans, human beings, or citizens, which lives in a particular place, and their landscape, or their na natural national history, for example, and which are the most interesting differences that you've noticed with compared to the UK? Yeah, I think. Um the most startling, the, the most startling uh, example of that. I mean, landscape's very, very important to me. Uh, and it isn't just a city landscape, uh, but you know, the, it's wherever I'm walking, I'm, I'm kind of thinking and and, and, and observing and looking. Uh, the, the first time I experienced a completely different thing, actually, ironically, was Los Angeles in 1984. I arrived in LAX wearing a suit because I was a Fulbright fellow in spring and the temperature was goodness knows what and after a while after really only a couple of hours meeting the people uh, whose apartment I was going to be staying in I walked down to Venice Beach and, and Muscle Beach and was really realized I was then in a very different completely different culture um, and that that they may speak English, but but that was about as far as it went. And I found it inspiring because I could really, really, really begin to understand. In Los Angeles, I, I understood better the notion of settlement and no nomadic uh, things, uh, and and consuming consumables. Uh, in Poland, 
for example, I, I did a, a very, the first time I went to Poland was to do a talk at Lublin University, it's a famous university for uh, medical science, and I, I was doing a little bit of research into uh, a medical science thing, but I did a, I did a lecture on sacred art, and, and I think they just must have bullied the students, because the, 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 the lecture theatre was full. In the, in the medical science school? Or no, in the, in the, in the, in it was the, the art bit. So, but <laughs> they, in, in, in a Catholic country like that, sacred art is considered to be lots of crucifixes, variations on crucifixes. And I came along and I, I did a lecture about Chatham Vines and, and, and all the work that I do. And, and they absolutely went nuts for it. And I was really shocked at the reaction. And suddenly realised that there was a hunger there for amongst the art community to 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 understand that that there is sacredness in the mundane, uh, and and not necessarily have to comply with with a, a Catholic iconography which litters the landscape. That's not anti-Catholic because, in fact, the, some of the the priests I met over there, uh, including the bishop actually from. Kelsey uh, were inspiring. I mean, they they again the the landscape and the people I met fuse. So the answer is yes, of course. Where, wherever I go somewhere, I before I make a work for that other country, if I haven't been before, I will go out and spend quite a, a while uh, there and then go back and think about it and then go back again and make the work so that there's a, often a big gap there. But people are brilliant. I find all people brilliant. You know, it, it is, I do really, really think people are brilliant. Yeah. All the time. They're just, they're funny. Um, just coming back to the um, Fulbright Fellowship, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about the impact um, that receiving that, being one of the first people to receive um, the fellowship had on your career. And I wonder if you consider that a pivotal point in your career, having that time over in LA. Yeah, I, I think it was. Uh, before the, uh, it was the first Fulbright Fellowship Visual Arts, I was nominated by Edward Lucy Smith. Um, and, and I, I remember uh, going down for interview and actually being very young at the interview and saying to them, um, I don't want to be associated with any university. I really think higher education is on, on the wane and just I'm not interested. Don't want to be, I want to work on the streets. I want to make work for various locations in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Washington DC, New York. Uh, that's what I want to do, and I'm going to look at a sense of place as, a, as an overarching title, and, and look at the condition of a public within a sense of place. And, and that's all they said. And I thought, well, John, you know, came out of the interview, thought, it was and then they phoned me up and said, we'd love you to do it. Uh, and yes, it, I think it, it was very important. Up until then, I, you know, I'd started to do, I'd had a show in, in 81, at the Walker Art Gallery it was the Peter Moore show. So I'd shown with uh, Gilbert George and uh, Michael Sandal and Henry Moore. Uh, and so I was the young kid really being brought out on and brought in um, to, to do a certain type of work and be used in a certain kind of way. But I didn't find it satisfying. I, I myself and Anne, uh, though, did enjoy that show because of the Adolphi Hotel, which had a big bath in it. We were really poor. So we spent the whole day just having baths. And then the whole night we spent with Gilbert George getting drunk, to the extent that the hotel actually came and said to us, you've drunk every bottle of wine in the hotel. And we believed them and, <laughs> and went to bed. So there had been incidents up till then. But what happened in America was that I decided I didn't had to, I didn't have to run towards the commercial gallery uh, thing to survive. That there was a possibility here of other things that can make me more interested and the work richer um, and, and more instinctive and more freer, really, 
just to keep going and do stuff. So yes, it was very important. And, and just to add to that as well, um, and having worked um, for quite an extensive period of time in higher education, I wonder if you could just talk about um, your thoughts about the future of art education yeah. in this country and the way that things are going. I, uh, it's so difficult. I mean, the, the first thing I would come in on that before I talk about that is to, something I did want to mention tonight. I find it perplexing, and, and this group of people here, and we should all be doing something, to have the baccalaureate without art in it, uh, and indeed RE. I mean, come on, let's let's be really sensible. RE, okay, is a really it's a really important subject. It's where you learn about other cultures' belief systems. We live in a world where other cultures' belief systems are, in a way, because we are so ignorant, uh, they're leading to people killing each other. To actually take that out of a curriculum, to have a generation that don't understand what Hinduism is or Buddhism is, or, it's, just, it's just frightening. To take art out of that curriculum is, is equally frightening. It, it's completely wrong. and it, it, We need to really somehow, artists are rubbish at lobbying and, and gathering around and marching on London, but I think really in this one we should. Higher education, I think, I think uh, historically in this country has been so strong and so rich and you know I've, I've taught on a creative arts course, contemporary arts course, live art course, all at NTU uh, and then a little bit in fine art uh, before I was doing a lot of research really. Um, and I think I think the trick for the lecturers is to is to understand that the institutional values are not necess necessarily should not be become necessarily at odds with their values in other words when they see people promoted because they ticked a lot of boxes then get the boxes changed you know that that needs to try and happen because that's important I, I'm not despairing of, uh, you know, I've been to a lot of art schools in, and in quite a few uh, countries as well. And, and certainly, you know, Fine Art NTU, for example, I saw the show last year and it was just, uh, my only criticism was that it was too good, that it just felt, it felt like walking through the pages of Freeze magazine. And I, that, but that's a compliment. I just was bowled over by it and just thought, blimey, these are, these are autonomous, complete works of such of such maturity. I was I was shocked, and it's brilliant, and that's a testament to the the, the the teachers of that place. I think one of the problems has been research, and it's research into art and research through practice has really damaged the the kind of synergy that that has happened with the traditional art school. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but research into art I can completely understand because it, it does have research rules and tools, for, but re research through practice is problematic in the extreme and, and the kind of institutions are seeing research as kind of another cash cow. So the pressure for people like me, actually one of the reasons for leaving early from the university was just too much work, I couldn't cope with both jobs and I was always part time as well. So. But it, it was that I couldn't do HRC forms. I just couldn't do them. And the university kept saying, you've got to earn a million quid HRC research funding or we'll, uh, we'll, we'll cut your wages or we'll, we'll you know, cut your hands off, basically. <laughs> and, and I gave up in the end on, on all of that. And I, think, I think there is a, a real problem between what actually goes on in art and, and what is perceived as a HLC kind of funded research, you know, except the kind of research that looks, it researches into art rather than through art. Can I, can I just add to that because <coughs> John and I talk, have talked about this over the years quite a bit because my PhD was through a department of theology mm. but about contemporary art and the theologians in the department couldn't understand what I was trying to do because the methodologies in looking at art are different to the methodologies used in theology but it just happened I 
start out going through the Department of Theology. And I found it very liberating going to a school of art and becoming a fellow in a school of art. But at the same time, very frustrating when there is this different methodology where I'm, t you know, where I'm talking about my writing as practice, my research as practice. And yet I'm seeing colleagues who are trying to fit into narrow boxes defined by external, in a sense, other disciplines which weren't designed to think visually and weren't designed. That was a problem that the theologians had was I was looking at people thinking visually and they were thinking in a kind of um, literary way and the two don't really necessarily match up. And I think we have that problem in, in the kind of fine arts where people are being asked to apply non, because there aren't any written, but yeah, the visual is the tool. Um, the visual way of understanding it is the tool and yet people are using psychology and, and there's nothing wrong with that but, but you know, when you're using psychology and semiotics and linguistics as a research tool to understand the visual I think there's a lot more work we need to do to actually understand and devise a methodology for really understanding visual art knowledge and it isn't there yet and yet we are, as John said we are being made at times to jump through hoops yeah, I think I, 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 I think art does have a, the highest yeah. possible ordinal range. In Absolutely. other words, it, it has the capacity to collaborate with all disciplines, um, and I really do believe in that. I think few, so. My criticism was not really that. My criticism <laughs> was that the way I am, I can't do HRC for you know because they they kind of demand stuff that just seems contrary to what I want to do. My, <clears throat> I think the f if, if, if I was now a 17 year old entering art education as I did in the 70s, uh, I, I couldn't because I, I come from a, a, you know, I was coming from a family where my father had died, I failed my 11 plus, my father had died at 13, my mother had had as a consequence of that, a kind of breakdown, and I was a complete mess, really, as an adolescent. And I found this thing called a foundation art course, which I began to enjoy, uh, and then just about got into Stoke on Trent to do a, an undergraduate degree, went on to Chelsea to do an MA, and on to Wolverhampton and Phil. It was nine years, actually, all in all, uh, all of which was paid for. Uh, and there's no way that I could have done what students have been asked to do now. I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So the kind of desperateness from failing the 11 plus and kind of sort of feeling that I was in the wrong school and eventually going to a comprehensive school, which kind of completely helped me. Um, I, I think what, what would have happened is that I, I would have done something else, but I, I feel like I was wired really to do what I've done. I managed to just keep going. I think future art schools will probably be uh, pretty well like they are now, actually. I think they'll keep going. They're very, the strongest ones are very good. Trent is one of the strongest ones. Norwich is a great school. Uh, there is a, a school called uh, Piet Swart School in Rotterdam that I've taught in, uh, it's amazing. The Helsinki Finnish uh, School of Royal Art, which I've worked in, is phenomenal. Uh, and so as, as long as, you know, as long as we have a generation that really just want to go somewhere, learn, shed loads, and explore the world that they live in, I think we'll be okay. But the finances of it all really, really, really worry me. Um, and, and I'm not suggesting everybody should do an art school course, but I think everybody should do a foundation actually at some point. I'm also a big believer in the French system. I think everybody at the age seven should have philosophy and, and political education. It's something that our, our students miss. Our, our youngsters miss out on the currency of ideas from that very early age, which the, the French introduce. And, and it shows in their culture, it shows in their ability to articulate ideas. Not necessarily the the art that they produce, but but what they have produced. So I think you know, I yeah. Thank you. 
Um, just a footnote for the benefit of the uninitiated, the AHRC is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Oh, yeah. Who provide funding for research and since, I don't know, the 90s sometime, this is also included. Re re funding for artistic practice and slightly provoked by this artistic practice need to articulate itself as a form of research but my point would be not to give up because there's every danger oh, that, yes. that funding could be sucked yeah. back in from where it came from no I, I agree with that <laughs> in, in fact you know I completely don't I mean you know it they have good 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 money uh, Still, just about. But there are other things. But it, this coming up, there is a research assessment exercise which all universities go through, where they look at research. And I looked, uh, and I'm part and parcel of that still with Tran. Um, uh, the submission for that is this time around is the REF, isn't it? And I, I my heart sank a little bit because I looked at the panel uh, looking at this. There are no practicing artists on that panel. Really? No, no. There's, a, there's one designer that I'm familiar with. I don't know who any of the others are, and I am really, I do know about contemporary art. Um, so I, was, I think that kind of says it all a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very disappointed. And it's probably because practicing artists would be insane to try and do that job. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, got time. somebody's got to do it, you know. Uh, otherwise, we're, we have no representation. But the time, the time, it's coming, isn't it? The, the more we do, the more PhDs in in mm. in, combined, in practice which are out there, there is a research methodology building. Mm. At the moment, it's still, as I, as I was saying earlier, it, it's other methodologies being used to understand art methodology. And I think that's what you're that's what you're saying, John. That some that at some point, hopefully, we'll get people looking at what we do from yeah. within. Yeah. PhDs are great. I think yeah. PhDs are very important because they, they do teach methods of research. Absolutely. They, they teach that kind of agreed way yeah. of doing things. So, you know, I've been gobsmacked with this, the students I've supervised. Mm. I mean, that, it is a kind of the supervision students kind of love affair, mm. really. And, and I've always been tried to support them as much as possible in terms of the currency of ideas and, and how the ideas can flow around. They have always impressed me and are stronger than me at, at understanding these these various methods. Uh, so I applaud that. I yeah, think absolutely. it's great. I think that um, you know, in your conversation with, with James as well as Richard, it's evident that you you do have a kind of understanding of what your own methods mm. are, and you have opportunities to reflect sure, upon yeah, it yeah, and, yeah. and see it. Um, I think we have a little bit more time if if anyone else wants to contribute a question. Uh, yeah, thanks. I enjoyed the talk and enjoyed the exhibition. Um, I, this is a question about um, not mystery but uncertainty. Uh, I guess there is a difference. Um, uh, one of the things I was struck by looking at uh, your work is uh, how fastidious it is, uh, the attention to detail. And I'm not like that. You know, my disposition is different, let's say. And I would interpret that as evidence of a perhaps a, a need to control mm. and uh, perhaps a slight anxiousness. Mm. And I'm not saying that that's how it is. And also, uh, I also find in your work a kind of, you know, I know, I know you feel that people are brilliant and we know that they can be, well, wow. <laughs> but, um, but you relate to people uh, through in quite a systematized way and you basi basically set up uh, um, procedures for projects that are you know, quite carefully followed. And therefore the question is really about the relationship between you know, this interest in uncertainty on the one hand and this what seems to be a need to control things actually down to quite a exacting degree on the on the other and there also seems to be a kind of pushing outside the
comfort zone. Well, to me, I mean, if I'm, that's interpretations along the right lines, because if you, if you weren't perhaps more naturally inclined towards mm -hmm. fairly closed systems and fairly controlled situations, then putting yourself in situations to dealing with the public and public art is definitely sort of pushing at the, pushing at the edges. So I just wondered what you saw the relationship between uh, certainty and uncertainty, control and lack of control within your own work. Yes, yes. Uh, yes it's a good question and it's, uh, it's something I, I'm quite conscious of really. So I think I, I kind of believe uncertainty to be very important and at the same time I, I have rather than control I think it's care uh, I want I, I want to care about everything I do so that in a sense that there is a control for me and and but it's but it's kind of uncertain because of the whatever evolves whatever happens the next stage is is going to happen. So, so in a way, when you grow something, you don't have any control on it. I mean, you have, of course, to to try to uh, grow something or get something to work. But sometimes it won't. It'll die. And so that there is a relationship really between me needing to to have clarity to myself about what it is I'm doing, in the knowledge that what it is I'm doing actually is going to be uncertain. But there needs to be, I do need structures that I look at it, it, so that I can understand better what it is I'm trying to look at, if you know what I mean. So it's kind of, it, it's very much like that. The other thing is that I am socially quite, quite shy in many ways, so that pushing the boundaries and talking with people on the streets and working is quite difficult for me. Uh, One of my favourite things in all the kind of images of your work and of you working is mm. the photographs of you uh, distributing newspapers on the trains in Lincoln, mm. because you can see you can see that kind of interaction with those people. You can see yeah. the uncertainty in their faces. You can see a bit of uncertainty <laughs> in, in your face. Yeah, yeah. But you and you can and sometimes you you, you see a bit of joy and, and yeah, that yeah, yeah. It, it is a bit like it, it's. Uh, I was thinking actually this afternoon. I mean, because for, as the, as Richard has written the book, I mean, uh, Richard uh, sat. Uh, uh, brilliantly with me and kind of interviewed me week after week after week about various uh, ideas and thoughts uh, of which one of them is uncertainty and Richard has written quite I think brilliantly about about that but what happened is of course that Richard kept reminding me that you know I'd been working for a long time and uh, when uh, I've never not been commissioned to do something since something like 87 so I've always been working on something and you tend to forget you, you tend to forget about the whole thing really and Richard uh, very kindly helped me remember that and, and in a sense what I've done is kind of taken a huge deep breath in about 1976 uh, and haven't breathed out yet and kind of still holding that that in me uh, as I, I want to as I learn more and want to express more and share more uh, and also look at different the possibilities for art in different spaces and places. One of the things which struck me about the, no, the nature of John and uncertainty is that, as you say quite rightly, John is very controlling. You know, he wanted to see this book and we wouldn't let him and he got very upset about that. Yeah, but I didn't get upset. upset you wanted this. <laughs> It wasn't frustrated. It was frustrated because he wants it. But that's how he works, and that's how he creates these beautiful works. But so much of his work is about otherness. And that's where the uncertainty comes, is, is this reaching out. So he, he controls himself, this imminence, and then he reaches out beyond himself. And that's where it gets really exciting, is he allows uncertainty in 
as he reaches out to what lies beyond mm -hmm. him which he cannot control. Mm -hmm. And so whether that's nature, whether that's the people on the Euston Road that he's dealing with, whether that's um, what happens when you inject wine into, into a um, into glass or what's going to happen with the machines that he constructs. The otherness is where the uncertainty comes and I think that is a fundamental insight that he, you know, it, it, it isn't a unique but it is this insight that, that the other is where uncertainty lies and we should embrace that and, 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 and actually not be afraid of that. That you know, the the, the 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 nice safe place where he'd really like to be is is just being himself, not having to deal with anybody other than you know, kind of what he's doing. But every day he reaches out and goes out in the garden and deals with squirrels, or deals with plants, or deals with vines where you know it's too hot and they and they die. Mm -hmm. And that's where you know every day he's reaching out into the space beyond. And finding uncertainty and mystery and, and wonder, and that's I think what his practice is about is is the walk out beyond himself into the space beyond. I feel like this particular discussion could be continued, but <laughs> we're coming up to running out of time. I don't know if anyone wants to a, pop a quick question in. I was, was going to ask a question. You, and you talk about the space between uh, theology, philosophy, and theology, philosophy, and work that you do. And Sorry. In interesting conversation where you've, you've talked about these crossover points between these different disciplines. And I just wanted to ask you because, and the prompt for it really is people like Kandinsky and their relationship with music and, and, and how that plays into art. And I'm thinking of a, an old friend of mine uh, used to be a, a music critic who had a very serious oral impairment and in terms of getting back to listen to music, he wrote a book about it and he explains that he was listening to classical music in terms of concrete shapes or architectural shapes. And I'm just wondering how music informs the way in which you approach your art. Yeah. Well, that's a kind of that's a kind of sinus, synesthesia. I mean, for me, I, music is important to me, but but it's mainly kind of uh, you know, it's seventies music really, and, and and I play it loud uh, just for different moods that I need to be in. Um, so, you know, if I if I've had a a, a really actually a really bad day I, m I might well play uh, after the gold rush because it, it kind of evens me out but I, 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 I that's how I look at me my, my interest in music is to do with it, it, it's very it's very Catholic I mean it's kind of all over but I, I, I do like kind of the music that has a narrative or a, that just is somehow gets my adrenaline going more or makes me go somewhere else in my head so I, I kind of use music like that. Can I just suggest that it's not music as such with you, you don't talk about music yeah. but you do talk about poetry, poetry oh, poetry is, is really what it, it, I think is the equivalent of music for, for you know, there are artists you say who find poet, who find music essential in their work and their work response to it. Poetry, it seems to me, when when you talk to John, poetry is what constantly comes back, back in you. And you're often oh, yeah. peppering conversations with, with bits of poetry and and just a line that you remember from childhood, like the yeah. turning and turning in the widening jar, yeah, yeah. and other bits of poetry in those text pieces. Yeah. Which aren't necessarily poetry, but but mm. are like poetic lines, which oh, text text is really. I, I think I've misunderstood the question a little bit. I t for me, uh, yeah, poetry text is, is 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 crucial. I mean, a lot of the works I'm doing at the moment are, are taking either some text that I've done or or a Thomas Paine text, or a, I'm currently working on The Wasteland, where I 
convert the text into a soil and then the soil grows something with the with the notion that the roots of whatever is growing in that soil and the soil is is nearly 80% just text uh, that that text somehow goes into the into the plant itself so the you know the the constituent elements of the plant or the tree are, do actually contain literally and, and metaphorically that text so poems like The Wasteland I, I think is, is an absolute and I've rewritten The Wasteland many times for other kind of works and texts that I've done it, it, it's the most amazing poem W. B. H. I I think is amazing Shane Sheeney is just incredible philosophically probably Heidegger a little bit but how I work is that I I hear something and that uh, and I do a bit of research so like walking sticks I know how you get a perfect length for a walking stick so you know you you measure the person add half an inch and then look at the relationship between the floor and the second second wrinkle in your wrist so I'm interested in that kind of practical information um, I might want to know a little bit about something else and so I will find it but uh, and I, I find it absorb it take it on the long-term stuff that stays with me all the time is really the poetry and some of the philosophical things I know like and Sam's always beyond theory I love Anselm's Always Beyond Theory because it says the words always beyond and it's one of the times when theology and philosophy adopt the same theory so it's, a, it's quite an amazing point in the whatever century it was, was written in and it kind of goes like Anselm was trying to define God and spent his whole life doing it and in the final paragraph he, he kind of comes up with a just before he dies actually comes up with statements that sort of says you know if you if you think you know God you can't know God because God is greater than what you can ever know it's kind of, and that's why it's called the always beyond theory and I, I kind of like the beauty of that really. that it, we are never there uh, and we can never be there because we are predisposed not to be there we uh, so everything is always beyond and occasionally we grab little bits of it and then move on towards where we want to try and get to on our adventure we don't really have such things as journeys because we don't have destinations because we don't know what they are so in a way what we've got is adventures everybody's on a kind of an adventure it can be really hard really desperate but that that is essentially what what we're doing. Thank you very much, John. I think that's a, a good note to end, end, stroke, begin, stroke, end on. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. For returning, participating in this conversation. Thank you, James. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, and we will be sticking around a little bit longer if anyone wants to just approach any of us for a quieter word. Um, but thank you. Thank very you. Much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you as well.